actually did as an action with that person, it actually harmed them. I was almost fully unconscious at the time. Hey, it wasn't me. I wasn't even aware at the time. But nonetheless, it harmed them, the action that I took. But it's also sins of omission. So there are things that I could have done to help somebody. It would have taken me 60 seconds. I could have been somehow more conscious. I could have said something to them. I could have offered something to them. It would have helped them. And I missed it. And so it's a matter of really observing and illuminating these different aspects of ourselves and then stabilizing them. For the Rosicrucian uh, teacher, people like Steiner, the first thing they look at is, are these things stable in a person? If a person does not have stable thinking, feeling, and willing, no higher development is possible. These things are the absolute foundation. Now, this doesn't mean that there's not a lot of more advanced work to do, but without this, there's no foundation to the building. The building will collapse. Then, of course, we have to start working on soul qualities to orient this the right way. So the next thing is to work on positivity. And Steiner used to like to give this illustration about a Persian legend of the Christ, where the Christ is walking down the road, and he and the disciples pass a dead dog, and the dog has been dead for days. There are maggots crawling in the dog, there are flies in his eyes, it's, it's really grotesque. All the disciples like, ooh, and turn away, except for the Christ, who just keeps looking and walks by. And then after they pass it, he smiles and turns to the disciples, and in this Persian legend, he says, what beautiful teeth that animal had. <laughs> you know, he's looking for the positivity in that. And so to always look for the positive, to keep that energy up, because what you'll find is that, you know, we all know that positivity is important, but you'll actually find that it changes the vibrational quality of the subtle bodies in a way that changes your resonance with other beings that has to be present to resonate with the beings that we're aiming for here. And openness. Openness is also sometimes referred to by the Rosicrucians as equanimity. And so this is being open to new information, new ways of seeing things. The Rosicrucians are really strong about not getting stuck in one way of seeing things. So everything that Rosicrucians teach is not dogmatic. Because if it's dogmatic, it's one perspective, and this is the only true perspective, and it's not seen that way here. The openness is to be able to see things from multiple perspectives, and the more perspectives you have, the closer you get to its reality. Like the blind man and the elephant. You're stuck with a spear and a pillar and whatever else until you see all the different perspectives and you know, hey, it's an elephant. By the same token here, this has to do with the uh, particular soul capacity that Steiner refers to as being able to walk a circle around anything in our lives, around any subject. And in walking the circle, we need to see it from 12 different perspectives. And in a way, that's what the world religions are. They're walking a circle around a central reality and seeing it from different perspectives. Not one is right and one is wrong. It's walking the circle and seeing from an opposite perspective of yours, and you see more of the totality of what's held in the center. Now, it was also, <coughs> called, it was also called equanimity because it has to do with not having emotional reaction <coughs> to other ideas or things that come up. And so there's a certain stability that comes with this. We're open to things, but we also have a very stable internal soul life. <coughs> We don't fall into reactivity. Because for anyone here that's done emotional process work, which is probably the majority of people here, you know that the reactive mind and reactivity is a thing that constantly brings us down. And the last part is simply to harmonize all this together, the harmony of all aspects. <coughs> because when you're not used to doing this, you've got to focus on one thing at a time. Okay, today I'm focusing on observing my thinking. Today I'm observing my feeling, etc. But once it's <coughs> become second nature, all of this needs to flow into a complete totality that you don't even think about. This is the foundation and the background for doing the deeper work. So that's the six basic exercises. I just want to give you an idea of a few other of these uh, practices as we come to an end here. Another practice was called the backward review. The backward review is very important to do at the end of every day. In Steiner's own initiation school, he made it a basic practice for everybody. What the backward review is, if you work with German Rosicrucians, they'll always use the term Rückschau. Rückschau just means backward review, basically, or to look backwards. Is that at the end of your day, as you're about to go to bed, the meditation to do is to uh, intensively, from that moment when you're about to go to bed, go backward through your day in reverse order. Now I'm at the moment just before I went to bed. Now I'm at the point where I went to the bathroom. Now I'm at the point where I watched TV. Now I'm at the point that I had dinner. Now I'm at the point that I'm driving home from work, etc. You go back through the day all the way back to the point when you were last asleep. It might have been a nap. It might have been uh, early that morning. 
And there's very deep spiritual processes behind this that we're not going to get into all the details of now, but it, it relates to some very important energetic processes in a human being. But by going backward through that day until the last time that you woke up, what you're actually doing is you're becoming conscious of the activities of that day. So it's a part of this whole waking up process. There are all kinds of things laid inside of it. So one of the things is that by going backward, thinking backwards, we're actually developing a new strength, like reflexing a muscle within our etheric life body. The etheric life body is our body of memory. And the etheric body holds all of our life forces. When we begin to exercise the capacity to think backwards instead of forwards the way we normally do, we're actually exercising something in the life body of memory that will become a force that can be used for higher initiation and alchemical purposes later on. But we'll stick with this for the moment. So moving backward and looking at that, we're developing this new force. But another thing that it can do is it can allow us to observe things that happened during the course of the day that we did not expect. So a corollary to this is that when we wake up from the nap or we wake up in the morning, we spend a moment before we get up in what we think is going to happen. Okay, I think I'm going to work, I'm going to meet so-and-so, blah, 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 blah. And I got a sense of general plan of the day. Now then, when you, at the end of the day, look backwards, you sometimes find that very different things happen than you had planned, or that things that were completely unexpected somehow inserted themselves. And what develops over time with this observation process is you begin to become aware of the spiritual beings and forces that came in at that time to bring something unexpected, something you didn't plan. And this is a very important adjunct to what's being taught in some metaphysical circles today about, you know, create your day and you control everything in your life. It really has got to be in a balanced format where there's a certain amount of what you create and a certain matter of openness for what spirit can bring to us. So we don't try to like rigidly control, no, I'm going to control every minute of my day. <laughs> the spiritual forces are going to bring things in that we don't expect. And if we look back on our life history, if we did this back review for our entire lives, and we would find like some of the most important things that happened with us, where we went to certain places, or we learned certain things, or we met a certain person that ended up changing our whole life, or we got married to, or whatever it was. These are things we never expected. We couldn't have planned. Something else brought us to that resonant point of intersection. We're not getting into it tonight, but a part of this also then links to the classical concept of receiving the conversation of the holy guardian angel. Guardian angel is a spiritual being that's the closest to us, and through this practice we begin to become more conscious of its activity with us every day. I could go on, but you get the idea of the backward review. Next we have the observation of life forces, of growth and decay. Today we have this fantastic tool where we can uh, use film equipment to literally see these like Walt Disney films of a seed sprouting and then becoming a plant and blossoming and fruiting and withering away, and we can see in a moment what the Rosicrucians classically did through a process of observation that would like take an entire year. They would like watch every part of a growth process. For any of you that have children, you've done the exact same thing with your child. You saw every stage of the growth process of that child and how these forces then naturally unfolded in a particular way. Now the observation of the life forces does something very significant, very important, and that is that it develops a particular type of clairvoyant faculty inside of us to see how things move through life processes from one stage to another. Because if we can begin to see that, first we observe it in the natural world, then we develop this as an internal capacity to do everything from uh, understanding human spiritual evolution over time to if we encounter a particular person, to see where they are on a process of crystallizing their I am self-awareness. Now this then leads to the concept of when we encounter any person in Rosicrucianism, the goal is to, when you encounter them, to see their archetype, to see their ideal self, their spiritual core, and where that spiritual core is going. We're all different. We're all like snowflakes. We're all made of frozen water in a sense, but we all have a different geometry. Significance of that is that we're developing different skill sets that when, as a new spiritual hierarchy ourselves, as a new angelic rank ourselves, we're just at the adolescent stage now, where we're like 21 and running around, we don't know what we're doing, but we're semi-mature if we chose to act that way. We're in that stage of development where, as we move further down our lives, we'll end up developing certain sets of skills, understandings, knowledge. And so this is linked to the whole concept that over time, the things that cause us the most pain in life sometimes become the source of our greatest strengths. And so 
what we then begin to perceive in people is that there's been a trajectory 